First of all, we'll announce that we are recording this webinar. So those of you who are attending live, um, you know, we want you to be aware of that. And then those of you who are watching this in the recorded archived version, you know, we welcome you as well and um, welcome your questions to either to me or to Lisa or to Steve. And I'll introduce Steve in just a minute so that you can see who I'm talking about when I say you can direct questions to him as well. Uh, one of the other announcements I want to make quickly, a couple more. One is that we have now converted our webinars over to podcasts because we know that many of you um, are watching these in the archive version and you know have a, a drive from A to B often. So we thought that would be helpful. Um, I know there are times when the visual aspect is important, but then you can always go back and, and kind of capture that at another time. So um, the other thing is to announce that our final webinar for this series is going to be November 3rd. Michael Horn will be joining us. And interestingly enough, for those of you who have heard, Michael has left the Christensen Institute, is going off on some new adventures of his own. And um, actually, Julia Freeland Fisher, who did our last webinar, is taking his position with the Christensen Institute. And I'm looking forward to talking with Michael, not only to hear about kind of some of his future plans that he can share with us and some of his goals that I'm sure will um, help the, the world of blended learning, which has been a focus for him, and uh, virtual learning and all those kinds of things. Um, so we can then, you know, kind of learn about some of, uh, some of the different things he's done with Christensen Institute prior to his making this transition. I know he's still going to be connected with them, but I'm looking forward to that as well. So that's November 3rd. So um, in the meantime, though, I, I just, as I was recalling, we were having a short conversation before starting here, and I, uh, we were sharing with our presenter today that I'm actually um, in, a, in a motel, which is always kind of an interesting dynamic to make sure everything is working and everything's going great. But it reminded me of the time that I, uh, about six years ago, I did a webinar with Yang Zhao. And um, he was, you know, he, we were trying to set up a time. And the only time we could do was when he was going to be in China over there on some business. And so there was about a 12-hour difference. And we, you know, pulled it off. I think it was like at 9 o'clock. Um, Eastern time in the United States and, you know, 9 o'clock is time at night and so it was kind of worked out from both ends. But, you know, technology is amazing. It's really pulling together a world that's been much differently separated than it is now. So, um, again, we are all all over the place and um, it, it's kind of nice to be able to, to do these series of um, this competency webinar series with people who are located across the country. Um, in looking at the sponsors, for those of you who are viewing our screen, you can see that we not only is EdTech specialist sponsoring these, but we've got Michigan Virtual University, which is one of our virtual schools in Michigan. We've got My Virtual Academy and ThinkSpace, and all of these um, different entities have been very supportive of the efforts to put this all together, and it, it's really nice to, to have that kind of support because I think we're all finding that competency uh, conversations are the kind that, you know, we all need to know more about. We need a better understanding. We need to understand that it isn't one thing, you know, that there are a lot of different pieces to it. And I think we're finding that it's really starting to transform the conversations that everybody's having about everything. So it's not just about the competency piece. It's what's bringing to students. So, um, as I begin to look at transitioning over to you, Steve, um, I want to just, first of all, as I was saying to Steve prior to starting, and every time I look at the website where, um, you know, for, for the Virtual Learning Academy that, that Steve is the director for out in um, New Hampshire, you know, I just think about, you, know, you look at that and you think, oh my gosh, all the things are doing, how do we get there? And I think it's always important to kind of think about, you know, you get there by over time. None of these transitions, especially when you're looking at competency, happen overnight. I know that one of our presenters from Iowa suggested that you don't make a one-year plan or two-year plan, you make a 10-year plan. So with that in mind, um, it kind of gives you that little bit of sense of 
okay, so we can do this. We just need to make sure that we understand that, you know, you know, it's baby steps in the beginning because you're really changing the conversation and the culture, and then you really take big leaps as you start to move along. I don't know if that's true or not, Steve. You can let me know if the bigger leaps as you move along or not. That's what I kind of sense is that once the ball gets rolling, it really, you know, picks up steam. So it is my pleasure to um, introduce Steve Kosakowski, who is the um, director at the Virtual Learning Academy in, in New Hampshire. I We haven't connected a lot, Steve, but the, the conversations that we've had, you just ignite a lot of thinking um, for me and others who have joined in our conversation. So it is my pleasure to introduce you this morning and um, have you take the reins now and tell us all about everything that's going on in New Hampshire. Thank you, Marsha, and thank you for inviting me to be uh, a part of this webinar and podcast. Um, I think uh, we're doing a lot of very interesting things, and I hope that uh, uh, what I can uh, provide to your, your listeners and, and viewers is something that's of, of interest to everyone. And so I want to talk about uh, uh, where we are as a school and where we're going. One of the things I want to mention, I thank you for the plug for our website. Uh, our current website will probably be around for about two more weeks, and then we have a brand new website that's uh, being launched to showcase uh, what I'm going to talk to you about today, our new learning model. Um, so if anyone that takes a look now, uh, be prepared to, uh, I hope you might consider coming back in uh, maybe a couple couple of weeks, uh, probably uh, you know around the first week in November, and uh, I think you'll see uh, have a whole different experience and see some of the things we're, we're excited about bringing to our students. First of all, I'll give you a little bit of a, a background about VLAX. I'm uh, the co-founder. Um, I was an assistant superintendent in the New Hampshire School District. and We had a, a superintendent that I worked with that was uh, uh, quite a, an innovator, and one day he called me into the office and said, uh, after we had already launched uh, the first district uh, level uh, uh, charter school, which I got to be the co-founder on as well, he said, are we ready for a virtual school that could help our kids and help kids statewide? And then I was provided with the time to do design work. And, uh, then he retired and, and I made the transition to CEO at, uh, at the Virtual Learning Academy. And uh, uh, we've grown uh, quite a bit over the years. We're in our eighth year and we started with about uh, 700 uh, enrollments and redefine an enrollment as a half credit segment. Uh, and as of this June, we uh, we had an en enrollment of uh, right around 24,000 students, uh, most of which are are from New Hampshire. And we also serve uh, or provide services to students from outside of state on a tuition basis. Uh, if students are residents of New Hampshire, they attend VLAX free. And one of the interesting things about our funding model is that uh, it doesn't impact any local s school budget. So we get about 70% of our kids come from local schools, 15% uh, or so are homeschooled, and then the remaining percentage are divided among our full-time students, other charters, private schools, students who may have dropped out, those types of things. And I think one of the things that is uh, unusual about uh, our virtual school model is that we we do offer both part-time and full-time options for students, whereas a lot of virtual schools tend to do one or the other. On the slide you can see in front of you, um, the areas that are in the darker shade of blue are currently up and running, so we, we serve high school grades 9 through 12, um, and we are open enrollment, any pace, uh, so we have students who will enroll in a class today and get started probably next week. We have students who will enroll on Christmas Day and start soon thereafter. Uh, students work uh, at a pace that meets near needs. They one of the, the first welcome call with the instructor and the parent and the student is to talk about uh, how much time they might need to complete a course, and that can change at any point. So if a student is struggling in a certain area and they need more time, that's fine. Uh, it's since we're all competency based, it's about um, moving toward competency. It's not about saying you have to learn something by Friday or you're going to be uh, given a poor grade for it. Uh, you can also see we offer services to middle school, uh, both full-time and part-time, and 
Uh, we expect our, high, our full time enrollment to be a little over 300 this year. And as I said before, um, most of our students are part time. You also notice in the lighter blue that we have elementary school. Within the next year, we hope to start at grades four and five with uh, world languages and start to branch out from there. And in this January, we'll be opening our adult education wing as well. And we'll be offering high school credit, high school diploma for adults, enrichment, such as everything from uh, Mandarin Chinese to photography, um, and also workforce development. The more we talk to uh, businesses and, and people um, outside of a traditional K-12 community, there's a real big need for a lot of people to hone their math skills, their writing skills, um, getting into areas like computer science and, and so forth especially for people who aren't quite ready to go back to college or go to college for the first time when they're 40 years old. We, we get calls almost on a weekly basis of people saying, um, you know, I haven't been in a classroom for 20 years, but I'm thinking about going to college. Could I take some of your courses in preparation for that? And so those are things that we, services that we want to provide to people. As we talk about um, competency-based education, uh, one of the things as, as we've moved into this area in a deeper and deeper way is that it's not just about competency education. I'm really starting, I really believe now that unless you have a student-centered uh, approach to, to education and to learning, you're probably not going to um, really take advantage of the power of, uh, of competency-based education. And so I'd like to talk a little bit about what we mean by um, student-centered learning because I think it's an easy term to throw around. I think probably all educators will say, if you ask them, are you student-centered, they would say certainly because the definition means something a little different to most anybody who hears it. Certainly there are people who would say that um, being student-centered means that you like kids and you like working with them, and I would agree. I don't say think that it's not. But I think it's important as we, as we have terminology that we're throwing around that we try to come to some common definition um, of, of that terminology so that uh, we're all talking about something that's the same thing. So we've adopted this definition of student-centered learning from the Nellie May Foundation that it's personalized, competency-based, anytime, anywhere, and, and it's where students take ownership of their learning. But again, um, even these four points raised terminology that isn't necessarily all agreed upon. So when we say that learning is personalized, uh, we, we, we look at two terms, individualization and personalization. Neither is bad, but if we were to place them on a continuum and were to define it, we would say that individualization is where we provide a couple of choices or a few choices that are determined by the school for students. So it's really individualized. I would say as of today, we are an individualized institution. And that as we roll out this new learning model in the next couple of weeks, that uh, we will become much more personalized and really becoming much closer to being purely personalized. So for example, when, when a local school says, um, you know, what we're doing is providing extra support for students, we allow them more time to meet competencies, I think that's wonderful and I, I, I applaud them for moving forward, but I would still say that's individualized because uh, what we're saying there is there are th two or three new options that we have for kids, but we're not allowing the student to say, um, I want to design options for myself. And to us, that's the key to personalization is allowing the student to say, I want to design my own learning environment. And that environment might include the school and it might not. And I think that's a place where educators right now differ. Um, I've spoken to superintendents and principals who have said, uh, I have some of the best teachers um, in the world in my classroom, and I'm glad they feel that way, and I'm not going to debate that. But then the next statement is, and I don't want them going elsewhere to learn. And I, I, think, that's, um, I think that's really too bad, because I think we all know that we learn in many places throughout our life and to say that it can only occur in the full walls of the classroom of a traditional classroom I think is doing a disservice to our kids in this day and time. 
So I really look at personalization as the option for the student to say, um, you know, you've got a great curriculum, you have a lot of services, but I really think I could learn through an internship. I really think I could learn from being in a Civil War reenactment. I really think I could do some independent study on my own. Or I bring to the table some skills that you already, I already have that I would like you to acknowledge. Uh, I think that can be scary and that obviously can be hard to, um, something hard to manage and that's what we're, uh, we're working on doing. And you'll see in, when you look um, at the bottom of this graphic, it says courses, projects, teams, experience, and college. Those are each of our pathways, which I'll talk about more. But the students can choose from any of those pathways, and but they're not locked into any of them. They can also um, mix and match all of those pathways so that students really can make the decision on how they want to learn, where they want to learn, um, and we'll provide support for this. So that's kind of our take on personalization that's putting the students in charge. And then when we talk about competency-based education, our definition is pretty simple. Um, we just say that competencies are the big ideas um, or the enduring understandings. Something that um, perhaps if you were to say five years after graduation, what do we want students to still know and be able to do? Those are really the things that we want to hold kids accountable for not necessarily the minutia or when something happened on a certain date in history or how to uh, necessarily uh, do a particular problem in physics, but what are the big understandings and what are the important things that kids know to be successful in life. So that's how we define competency. Not necessarily the right way, but it's a way that we're comfortable with and we've found success with over time. And so our principles for that are that there's no time-based unit. I think this is one of the most important aspects of competency-based education and to me when we talk about unbound, learning unbound and really starting to give uh, students a lot of freedom in how they learn, this time piece to me is, is a real problem uh, because when we tell students that uh, we're going to be competency-based now but everybody has to learn at the same rate um, or you get a lower grade or a lower rating, um, I, I think that's I don't think that's fair to students. I, I think we really need to acknowledge that some of us will learn faster uh, on certain topics because of whatever the reason might be, whether it's engagement, excitement, or just innate talent, and others need more time. To me, what's most important is that we have kids all meet, meet the standards or the competencies that we set up and not uh, be told that they're either a success or failure because they have to know something by Friday. Um, if they can know something by next Friday, I think that's perfectly fine. And so the time-based unit to me is, is the real crux of it because I, I hear a lot about uh, a lot of schools who will say things like, um, we still hold kids accountable for um, meeting a competency by Friday, but we will then allow them to come back over the summer to make it up. Well, to me, that sets up that same situation where feel, a kid feels like a failure um, and it feels like they're being punished. Uh, so instead of doing that, why not allow them the time to master that competency? What I'm not addressing when I talk about that is procrastination and being an adolescent where kids just don't want to do the work. We know that and we still have to deal with that. But we're talking about the kid, uh, if, if, for example, if I'm in the area of mathematics and I struggle in mathematics, it's not that I can't learn it, I just may need some more time. And if another kid can move ahead quickly, then more power to them. I want to create learning environments where that's a possibility for all students. So I've already kind of covered the standards are fixed, time is a variable, pacing is flexible. Students move on when competent. Uh, and also they can't avoid a competency. I think we can all relate back to some time in our education where possibly we got a poor grade on, uh, on, a, on a certain topic, uh, a certain test, and we thought to ourselves, that's okay. Because if I get a 65 on this exam, as long as I get a high grade on the next exam, it averages out and my grade is still fine. I still get my B or B plus or whatever I'm hoping to get. Um, but what we've really done is we've skipped over a competency. We've, we've said that uh, we've been allowed to do that and we all know how to play that game. In a real competency-based environment, we're saying, no, you may not be ready to, to master that competency yet, but you're just not there yet. Keep working. 
And so we don't allow kids to skip around competencies in that way. And I think that sets them up for more success later on. And that kind of ties right into failure is not an option. We don't any longer have failing grades at, at, at VLAX. We have something called, um, well, it's just, we call it WINK, which means withdrawn and complete. So if we have a student who halfway through an algebra course says, um, I'm leaving, I want to go complete the rest of my algebra competency somewhere else, or I just don't want to complete this. In the past, we would have given them a failing grade. Now we just say they're not, they haven't met all the competencies yet. They've just, these competencies are incomplete that they haven't mastered. They can come back at any time and continue working on them when they're ready. Um, and so it's not about failure. It's more about you just aren't there yet. Um, you haven't demonstrated a competency yet. You're free to come back. There's no penalty. Um, and we think that is really consistent with um, the student-centered learning approach. So it still holds people accountable, but at the same time, it's not saying uh, that you're, you're a failure. Um, also, uh, and this I think is quite different for, from a lot of schools, is that courses aren't required in order to, to learn. Uh, that we provide the opportunity for, for students to learn through projects, through college courses, through, uh, through teams, and through um, any type of experience that we, they would like to design as well. So when we talk about competency-based education, it's all those things. It's a big understanding and then following these principles. Before you move on, um, I have a question on the, the time factor, um, I guess maybe about all the CBE principles. Um, so if the, do TVO take your courses for graduation requirement? Yes. Okay. So when you say that there's no time, there is some time in terms of they need it for graduation, but they could take, you know, could they take a course, your, one of your semester courses over a one and a half year time period? Yes, uh, we, uh, there's, to us, the, when, when you talk about time, there's always a real world time constraint on anything. If a student says, I want to graduate in four years, they've set up a goal and they need to work toward that goal. What we don't set up are the kind of the false deadlines of this Friday, next Friday, or the end of a semester, those kind of things that mm -hmm. have always been constructed. So, um, yes, and could a student take take a course over a year and a half? Yes, but there is a caveat. They have to continually be working. What we aren't trying to do is enable students to procrastinate or to be adolescents and, you know, just not do any work. Uh, what we're saying is you have to continually be working, but you can work at a slower pace. So if a student is stays in communication with their teacher and the parents are in communication, they're saying, I need more time, and they're still working and, you know, uh, either working in alternative ways as I've already outlined, that's all okay. But for a student just to say, uh, I just want to sit back and do one assignment every couple of weeks and so forth, that, that's, you know, we don't support that. We say, no, you need to be making good progress. Uh, so it's legitimate okay. progress, not just being, you know, lazy, I guess I would say. Okay, is that, great. Is that thanks for clarifying. Yes, thanks for clarifying that. Sure. Uh, the next piece is learning anytime, anywhere, and I think most people would understand this to be um, kind of online education that you can, you know, work on, uh, uh, I guess, work on a course at the beach if you want to. You can work on it at 10 o'clock today or 10 o'clock tonight. And those things are all true, but we want to push this definition a little bit and say that anytime, anywhere is also out in the real world. It's also outside of school. And I don't mean the place that you access your course. I mean that if a student says, I have a job working for a uh, software publishing company, and I believe there are things I'm working there, uh, working on there that will prove that I've met competencies at, at high school level, that we would agree with them. And we would work on how to assess that and how to uh, get evidence that the students have, have met those competencies. Or if a student says, I'm traveling. Uh, with my family. Could I meet a few competencies um, in Spanish because we're, we're going to Spain? And the answer would be would be yes. Or a student who says, I really have a passion um, for the Civil War and I want to do some independent study on my own or, you know, the example I used before, I'm going to be, take part in a Civil War reenactment. Again, we would set up, well, what are the projects, what are the, uh, what are the artifacts that prove that you've met that competency? 
we would plan with a student ahead of time to do that, and then they would participate and then prove to us that they've met that competency. Um, so again, anytime, anywhere is is just as likely to be outside of school in a non-traditional place as it is to be in school. Uh, it, it's not just about being able to use a wireless device. Um, and then the student take ownership. I think items one through three set up students to, to take ownership. I think a lot of times when people are talking about student ownership, they're really talking about incite, excitement and engagement. So they say, uh, look at all these new things we're doing in this traditional classroom and watch these kids because they're so excited about what they're learning and they really own it. And, and I agree. I, I, I think that's a valid point, but what we're really trying to say is that ownership is when students make decisions about something. To me, if uh, you uh, were to say I have to buy a certain vehicle, I guess technically I would own that vehicle, I would own that car or that truck, but it may not really be the one that I wanted to, so I wouldn't really you know, perhaps love it, whereas if you tell me I can go out and buy my own vehicle, um, Probably, you know, I get it in my color, I, I get it with the features I want. It's something I really say is, yeah, that's, that, that vehicle is, is mine. I really like it. Uh, I don't know if that's the best example, but that's one of the ways I try to look at it. That If a student says, I'm really excited about um, uh, learning, um, how to write, uh, learning how to write by working for a marketing company, I think they're going to really own the projects, they're going to be excited about the projects they're involved in versus a student who says, I really don't care, I don't really care for English, or they think they don't because they sit in a class and, and, and they're not excited by that. If they're excited by learning somewhere else, doing maybe the same competencies, we want to enable that. And, and so that's what we look at is ownership, when the student is able to take charge and, and really design something that excites them. And we think that uh, we'll see a different level of engagement when students do this. So that's our concept of, of competencies and, uh, and the idea that we're student-centered. So we say that we're student-centered and part of being student-centered is being competency-based. Uh, and I know the topic for this, this webinar was the competency piece per, first, but over the last few years we've moved away from just saying that we're a competency-based school to saying that we're student-centered school. Um, as I mentioned before, is there a question? Another, yep, another question came up in the chat was asking about the assessment piece for, um, you know, when students are developing their own courses um, or, you know, competency, what they want to do. So if they were to travel to Spain, who is creating that assessment? How, how is that um, determined? Uh, what happens is a student um, would, uh, would would sign up for the that option, uh, enroll in that option, and they would meet with an instructor who would uh, help them really design the project. So the student, we'd ask the student to start to really think about what is it, what competency is it that you really would like to address? Maybe one or two competencies on your trip to Spain. I'm going to digress a little bit here because I think one of the problems with kind of um, ELOs and internship type learning has always been that there's never a 100% match between the experience and something we call a course. So you're not going to meet all of Spanish 1, all the competencies of Spanish 1 by, your, by going on your trip to Spain, but you can probably meet a couple of competencies. So we need to design a system to allow us to do that. So going back to the question, um, what we say to the student is, okay, let's talk about what you're going to be doing on the trip. And maybe through that discussion, the student and the instructor determine that um, it really looks like you're going to meet the competency around culture in, in Spain. Um, that sure, you'll probably be speaking a little bit of Spanish, but perhaps you aren't doing enough of that to, to fully meet a competency. Um, so at this point, we can't, um, you know, we aren't going to award a mastery of that competency, but the one in culture, we certainly can. So then we would say, okay, what are the, uh, how are you going to demonstrate that? And the students may say, uh, well, gee, I could make a video, I'm going to uh, write a paper, I'm going to uh, create a scrapbook of photography, uh, you know, any number of, of ways to, to show that information. We have rubrics that we've created for each of our competencies, and students' uh, work would be measured against that. 
Um, and then for every competency, we also have something called a discussion-based assessment. So you have your, if you want to call them projects or formative assessments or whatever you want to call them, but then uh, the, the final assessment of that competency is through discussion-based assessment. And those usually take between 15 and 30 minutes. They're a one-on-one -on -one discussion um, following a set of pre uh, kind of prescribed um, questions that range um, in uh, depth of knowledge level from, from one to four. And we're really probing to make sure that the student has um, understood and has met that competency because we know that students can create projects that will wow adults but maybe don't have all the um, depth of knowledge that we want them to. So uh, one level of assessment is the project and, and what the student has done. The other level of assessment is do you really understand this? And so before the instructor will sign off on the competency, um, they have that discussion with kids. And at that time, they can also say, well, you need to do a little bit more work. You had a great trip. There's a lot of information here. But um, I'm seeing that you're not fully understanding aspects of the culture. Let's talk about how you can how you can meet this competency or, or finish up this competency. So that rubric becomes very important. And um, as we're developing these rubrics, we use them in a number of places. We use them for uh, projects, which I'll speak about. We use them in learning through teams. We use them um, with uh, uh, the experiences, and and they're also very similar to the ones we use in our courses. So I hope that answers the question. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Sure. So the slide I have up now, one of our different pathways is courses and always has been and always will be. Um, as I've already mentioned that our courses are, are any time, but also you can sign up for any portion of a course. So if a student comes into uh, a course and says, I'd like to uh, meet the first three competencies of eight uh, through this course and then jump out and work on a project and then come back, they can do that. Um, and, and so that any time flexibility allows that to happen. Uh, before the webinar started, we talked a little bit about competency recovery, and we were uh, we were written up in a recent uh, INA call report about this. What this also allows schools to do who, who work with us is if a student, for example, is um, one that seems to come up a lot is is in the area of mathematics, where a student will. Uh, take a traditional course once or twice and fail both times and then finally the instructor and the students sit down and say you know what's really held you up in uh, from passing this course or is a certain competency or a certain two competencies they can come and just take those competencies or just master those competencies through our courses or any other means and then they can take that uh, take that back to the local school and say yeah I know I, I failed but uh, I failed because of you know, not mastering these two competencies, and now I have evidence uh, for VLEX that I've mastered those. So our courses are, are used in a number of different ways. Um, and again, as we go forward, um, courses will continue to be a big part of what we, what we do. Um, the next thing are, are projects. And um, in our learning through projects area, what we've done is we've created essentially three to four week uh, performance assessments but they're all based on putting the student in a real-world scenario, um, and that real-world scenario is tied to a career. The, um, the focus is not on careers, but it's a kind of byproduct, because right now we have about 140 of these projects, um, and I think it represents something like 130 different careers. And so we have a, a team of highly trained uh, instructors who've been working on this over time, uh, and we'll continue to build projects for every one of our competencies uh, that will match up with uh, about 150 different courses. So if you look at an average of about um, eight competencies per course, you can see we're going to have a lot of projects uh, when we're done with this. But when we roll this out in a couple of weeks, all the core courses are, are covered right now. So a student can uh, say, I'd like to, uh, I would like to meet the competencies in English 1 through projects. And so these projects are built for them. And uh, I think you can see a couple of examples here. One I usually share is uh, Mandarin Chinese, where the student is um, put in the scenario of being an athletic trainer and working with Taiwanese athletes. And they have to create a 
uh, plan for rehabilitation of injuries. And so they have to communicate in Chinese with the athletes in order to, say, uh, help rehabilitate a sprained ankle or a sprained knee or something like that. And so that's kind of an example of one of the projects that a student would work on. And so instead of taking a traditional course, they could jump out and they could be working on these projects. Each lasts about three to four weeks and each are focused on a single competency. Um, I know we have another one where a real estate agent uh, is working on marketing a development uh, and they have to do a lot of narrative writing. And so they're, we're working on an English competency there. We have all kinds of other projects that are available for kids. So for kids who would say, um, you know, I don't want to be at a traditional course, I think I might do a better job through working on projects, they can mix and match or they can decide to do it all one way or another. The experience piece is really where the, the most flexibility is. Um, and, and so this can be travel, service learning, internships, on-the-job work, independent study, almost anything that the student can, can think of. And, and I think I've already explained through the uh, example of the student traveling to Spain how, how this works. Um, and, and this is the one that tends to get, uh, I think, most people um, excited or sometimes wondering how or, or if it all works. But um, as I was mentioning to Marcia early on, we one of the things we've done is we've, we've talked to the folks at Big Picture Learning uh, who have been doing this for years, not in an online environment, but their entire curriculum is, is really all um, based out in the real world uh, where their students have uh, really do all of their learning through real world projects and so they've they've developed a significant amount of expertise and uh, and so we've really uh, tried to learn from them as far as how to provide this online. We also have an area called teams and in teams what we do is take uh, have groups of students all work on a similar project. So what we could have is a group of um, say 10 or 15 or 20 students who all might be all might have a similar interest, say, in, um, in the environment, and they might be um, all collecting samples of, uh, say, uh, hemlock trees in, in their region, and, and then analyzing those samples to see, to determine the, the relative health of, of the trees in their areas, sharing that data, and then taking a look at that data across the, a large region to see if you, you find similar uh, changes, like if you see a number of the trees are not healthy in the North Country and uh, perhaps they're healthier in the southern part of the state, does this have something to do with pollution moving through the air and, and so forth. Uh, another example of this is a group of students coming together and learning computer coding to develop a, a, an application, a, tele, a phone application that could be offered through the Android store or, or through the Apple store. Uh, but a team of students would work on it much as a team would in business in, in order to create this app. It wouldn't be a single person. And so those are things that, that we, uh, those are some examples of the, the team projects that we'll, we'll have, we should have available in the next couple of months. So again, it's all about the students saying, uh, well, instead of meeting uh, a couple of math competent or a couple of, a couple of competencies in English through a course or through projects, I could also move into the team area and, and meet some competencies there and then jump back into the course if I wanted to. Um, and then college, we, um, we opened this program up uh, last spring and what we have available now is that students uh, can take one, two or three courses at the college level while in high school um, and these are not dual they're dual credit in the sense that they get a high school credit as well as a college credit, but they are actually, it's not the high school curriculum, it's the college curriculum that they're using. And uh, in most cases, it's taught by our instructors who qualify to be adjunct um, college professors. Uh, so what we have to do is before instructors eligible to teach, say, a sociology course as we send their credentials into the university, the university would say yes they have a master's in sociology that qualifies to be an adjunct and therefore they can teach this course. Um, and uh, so what we're able to do is a student can take a few courses, they can complete a full year of college while they're uh, in high school is another option or they can uh, they can earn an associate's degree uh, while in high school as well. And um, 
uh, as I mentioned, this is this program is fairly new to us. We're going to have our first two students this year uh, who are on track to get an associate's degree. And so what that'll mean is they'll actually go to the college graduation in May, uh, where uh, they'll receive their diploma, but it will be empty because you can't get an associate's degree before you graduate from high school. And then they will go to their high school graduation in June, and then soon after that in the mail they'll get their actual um, college uh, diploma. Uh, so we're pretty excited about having that opportunity for kids. And so the course itself is free to New Hampshire kids, and then they pay a hundred dollar fee to the college, and they get a transcript that, that says they've taken all the regular college courses. So it doesn't say VLAX on it at all, it says you know they've taken English Comp 101 or whatever it is. Um, in fact, one of the things we do is we require all of our full-time students to take a college course um, or to um, be part of a kind of career-related full-year internship. Um, and most of our kids uh, opt for, for the college courses. And we've had lots of uh, kids come back to us and say, I never thought I was college material. And this, by participating in this course, it's really made me rethink what I might be able to do in the future. So really excited about that, that program. So when we take all these things that I've talked about, we it becomes something we call flexible learning pathways. And so those each of the five areas that I've just talked about. But I think what's unique is that we're we can allow kids to um, really totally design um, how they would like to learn, and they're really they're not limited to the five pathways because they can mix and match. And so what the graphic is showing if you kind of match up the icons here, is that the student in this example has um, completed, met two competencies through experiences, has met two competencies through project, and then has met four competencies through a course. And then we can repackage all of that and say that this is equal to one credit. And the reason we do that is that even though a lot of schools are moving to be competency-based, very few are able to hand handle just competencies that are not packaged as credits. So we know that if we sent, if we, if we printed out a transcript with just competence, uh, competencies on it for say algebra one and sent it to a school, they will probably look at it and say, boy, we're going to have to really spend quite a bit of time to figure out what this all means. And so what we do is kind of say we've still got to work in that currency of a, um, of a credit. And so we're able to package them all no matter how the kid has met that competency and then put it back into a, a one credit uh, uh, grouping. There's also a technology infrastructure to make all of this work. And um, uh, Marsha opened the, the webinar by talking about how uh, it can take a long time and then that there are different places where you might jump forward. We've really had a big jump forward over the last year and a half because we were uh, fortunate to get a uh, relaunch grant from the Next Generation Learning Challenge folks uh, where we got a considerable um, sum of money in order to redesign our school. And so we've been working on that for the last year and a half. And the timing of this webinar is, is quite good in that uh, we're on the cusp of, of really rolling out all these new programs. And that's why I mentioned the new website that'll be available in a couple of weeks. And then and right, around, um, right around Veterans Day, uh, we'll start rolling out things like learning through projects and then soon thereafter learning through experience and so on and so forth. So what we've decided to do is we've really um, been rebuilding all of our technology infrastructure while we're flying the plane um, and uh, we're move, moving over to Salesforce. And the reason for that is that it's a platform where we can rapidly uh, develop and iterate and have new options uh, within our software within two to three weeks. Because we also know since a lot of this is all kind of new stuff that we're doing that probably our needs as far as technology support that we have today will be different a month from now. And if we were to purchase something off the shelf, we would be stuck with whatever is in that infrastructure. So what we found is that Salesforce is really going to allow us to do that. And there's been quite a bit of discussion recently kind of in the tech sector of education about Salesforce. Um, and one of the things that we're going to be doing is uh, anything that we develop we'll, we'll make available to the greater community through something called the Salesforce App Exchange where you can actually go in and, and be able to take some of the things that we've developed and, and use them on your own 
you'd still have to get the licenses for Salesforce, but if this is an area that makes sense to people, um, they certainly are going to have the opportunity to use a lot of this stuff. But I just want to show you quickly um, some of the things that uh, we've developed and are going to be rolled out. Uh, Masha, how am I doing with time here? I don't want to take too long. Uh, we're doing fine. We've got we have plenty of time. Let me just say that you we don't have a stopping point. Um, so you you know continue on. We've got at least you know another ten or fifteen minutes before the hour is up. Okay. We always entertain. Um, and I was gonna kind of wait for a second to jump in here to say too as well that if anyone would like to have a conversation with Steve, please just put that in the chat and we'll. I think most of you have your microphones open from our end. I think it's your end that you're muted. So, but feel free to either put it in the chat or just jump in at, um, you know, either now or toward the end, and we can, uh, you can have a conversation with Steve. So, um, this has been fascinating. Thank you, Steve. Go ahead. Sure. Thank you. Uh, so, this is our new uh, learning backpack, and uh, students, when they log in, they're going to see uh, see this this interface, and you'll notice that the kind of in the middle in the white section, this is my CCC plan. One of our goals is to have is to move all of our students to being college, career, and citizenship ready, and we're working on the indicators. But but in, from a simple form, the uh, the definition we use is that a student would be able to go to the community to any community college and be able to um, complete the first year without any the need for any remediation. And we want to have every student at that that level because it's our belief, and uh, I know that. I think we got most of this information from uh, David Connolly, Connolly's work at Epic, is that uh, in this day and time, if you're going to become a plumber, you're still going to need to have the, the computational and, and English language art skills of a, fr of a freshman if you're going to be successful in, in, in becoming a licensed plumber. Um, and I think that's the same for all trades. It's, it's certainly the is certainly the direction of going for all the new types of jobs. So I think to, to to tell any kid that because you're going into a trade, you don't necessarily need to have the academic skills is something that may have happened in the past, but it can't happen as we go into the future. So our goal is that every kid will, will be college, career, and citizenship ready. So there's a plan that our full-time students start working on as soon as their freshman year. Um, and it's not just a, a listing of their kind of goals and interests. It's really kind of an in-depth study of what would I like to do, um, how am I going to get there, how am I going to finance it, uh, you know, are my math scores where they need to be to be to work in this area. Um, we really want them not to, to be reflective on what they're doing and how they're going to get there. So we do that through an advisory program with our full-time students. You also see here the option to grab middle school or high school, then advanced honors and AP, college, um, all those different areas. So if um, I want to sign up for something, um, what I'm going to do is on the left-hand side, I select high school or middle school, and then I'm, I've, here I've selected mathematics and then algebra one. Now, when you look under mathematics, you see all the traditional kind of listings in math of math courses, but we've rebranded these competency groups because at this point, you're not selecting a course what you're doing is you're going to select which competencies you work on. And one of the thoughts we had um, as you really move to being fully competency-based is, well, why do we have courses? Why can't we just list all the competencies for mathematics? Um, and again, if you multiply, you know, between seven and nine or so competencies for each course, you're going to have a lot of competencies there. And we said we want an organizing structure. So we said, why not use the organizing structure that we've always used, which are courses. So we've left that structure in place, but we're rebranding it as competency groups. On the right-hand side, you'll see segment one, segment two, the competencies listed. If I wanted to see the actual competency and not just a title, I click on the little information symbol, and then it gives me the, the competency. And then uh, the student can select which competencies they want to work on. They could work on an entire course, or they could decide, right now, I just need to co concentrate on a couple of competencies. So you can see linear functions and quadratic formulas have been selected here. And then when you're done, you just say, add that to my backpack. And think of a backpack as the Amazon shopping cart, where you select a bunch of items, 
and then you say I want to check out and it sends you to the shopping cart. Here we're going to our learning backpack instead. So for this student, they've decided, well, I also want to go back and work on AP US government. And since the AP folks don't allow us to, uh, in a course, wouldn't allow us to uh, break it down by individual competencies, the software is forcing the student to take all the competencies at once because they still have to use an approved AP course if they want to get the AP designation. Uh, so that was one concession that we, we had to make where the student can't grab certain competencies to work on discreetly there. So anyway, they've done that and now they're going to go to the backpack and now we're actually in the backpack. And so what you can see on the left hand side is we have the um, we have the linear function quadratic function um, competencies and then we see the other competencies from US government. Um, next what we can do is we can choose between doing those through a course, through a project, through experience, and then as we have teams that would be up there. Um, and so right now the student has selected to uh, meet linear function and quadratic function competencies through experience. Um, then made decision, well no, I think I'll work on quadratic functions in the course. And then when they're all done, they can get ready to submit this and they can also select the date when they'd like to start on these competencies. And then um, hit submit and that goes off into our system and it's, it uh, assigns into an instructor who will then be in contact with them um, and then the instructor will know uh, all they're going to be working in the course and then they're going to jump out over the project so I've got to talk to the kid about how they would like to do that. And depending on time marsh I, I put kind of a soft stop here. I also have um, I also have some slides on how our new transcript and, and things are going to work and depending on your needs and needs of the listeners, I'm, I'm happy to continue or I can stop for questions, whatever you'd like to do. Well, I think my first question is to the participants. Um, do, does anyone want to have, does anyone have, want to have a conversation with Steve for a minute and see how, you know, if, if there's some questions that you would like to get a little bit more in depth with Steve about. You can either just jump in or put it in the chat, whichever you're most comfortable with. If not, Steve, I'll leave it to you because I mean, it, it would certainly, this is gonna be in a recorded format. So do you know how much longer you might uh, go with us this morning if we go into the next segment? Well, I can go through it. Pretty quickly, five to ten minutes if you like. Yeah, I think that would be good. I think the more information we get right now, the better. If that's okay with you, do you have the time? Yes, I do. Okay, let's do it. Thank you. Okay, so this kind of goes a little bit deeper into our software. Um, and, and so we need a way to, for our full-time students to do a lot of planning, but also we'll make this available to our part-time students as well. And I should mention that as we move from the backpack, this stuff right here is in development. It's going to take us a couple more months to get this rolled out, uh, whereas our backpack is, is ready to go now. Uh, it will be coming out in the next couple of weeks. So again, uh, they've already gone to the dashboard that I showed you, and now they've gone down and said, well, I want to start working on my uh, college career and citizenship plan. And you'll notice here what I have highlighted is let's look at badges and see what that looks like. So when I click on badges, I go into a screen where I start to see um, the competencies that I've completed for a STEM badge. And when we talk about badges, I, I know this is another area where a badge can mean everything from a, a former gold star. You know, I, I'm going to give you the good behavior badge today in the classroom. Um, and it can mean something much different. And the way we're, we're approaching badges is these are areas of concentration. So we'll probably, when we're all done, we'll have a computer science badge where a kid may have uh, three or four courses in computer programming. Um, and it really, it, it's something they can work toward, but it's also a way of advertising their skills and saying to either someone at the college level or an employer, I really have a lot of knowledge in this certain area. So this STEM badge obviously would be someone who's, who's got expertise, and really developed uh, some knowledge in, uh, in some area of STEM. And so you can see here the, the green bars are showing that they've met four competencies. When we get down to pre-calculus, uh, the yellow means that it's um, 
that they've signed up for it. The blue means that they're in progress, and the gray means that they haven't addressed those competencies at all. There's also a note section here where an advisor uh, and a student can start talking about how to plan this and how to time it, all those kind of things. You'll also notice um, down below it says computer science badge, one out of five, competencies, uh, wellness, industry badge, two out of five. When we have this fully operational, those are going to auto-populate. So in some ways, when a kid goes in, they're going to say, boy, I didn't know I had met the competencies for, started meeting the competencies for a computer science badge. I'm going to look in there and see what else is available. Um, and so some will be purposeful that a student will sign up and say, I want to work toward a STEM badge. Others will just be kind of showing the student that just through the natural course of events of completing a high school curriculum, you're starting to develop expertise in a certain area. And if you'd like to go deeper, we certainly would encourage you to do that. Uh, if I go back now and I click on my learning plan, um, this is where you start to have the option to re really plan out your entire academic uh, plan. And so here you'll notice again, we're using colors and so forth. And we're actually undergoing a 508 audit right now on this. And so some of the things like colors, we've got to change a little bit because if a student were colorblind and were to come in, um, they're not going to be able to understand this quite so easily. So uh, we need to make it accessible to, to all students. Uh, but what it's showing the student is that they've met the graduation competencies for art education because it's green, it's half credit out of half credit. Um, you can see other areas where they're still working. Um, and then, uh, you also see down at the bottom of the screen is showing your total number of credits, uh, how many credits you need for graduation, and so on and so forth. And um, then we come back here and let's go a little bit deeper. So we're going to go into English. And once I'm in uh, English, I can see that I've met some of the competencies outside of VLAX. So the student has met some of these competencies at Fortson High School. They've also met some competencies with us. That's where the green bars are. And then they're, they're uh, working on some other competencies. Um, then you can also see mathematics is kind of showing the same thing. And also notice the My Notes area where it's saying, you know, the, the student and the advisor have been leaving notes for each other saying, you know, here's where you're going to need to work on this and think about this in the future. So that we want our students always actively uh, thinking about what their strengths are, what their areas of need are, what their interests are, and how they're working toward those goals. Um, we can also go even deeper. And so if I selected Algebra 1, Segment 1, and went deeper, I can get down to the competency level. And I can actually see the work that the student has done. So I've gone down into math. I'm now at inequalities, and you can see it says show, show me the evidence. And when I click on that, I can get to the level where we have a listing of the evidence that proves that the student has met those competencies. And what they would able to be, be able to do from here, if you look under evidence of learning, it says video, real estate office internship, they would click on that video, and it would actually come up and show them the video. So it might be that that video was an exhibition of their mastery of, of that particular competency, and so you could actually see it. Uh, then you'll see there's a journal, what I learned, you click on that, you'll actually be able to see the journal. And so this is a way for the student to always be able to reflect and see what their learning is. Certainly they could, they could share this with a college admissions personnel, or they could show this with an employer, that they'll always be able to go in and show how they've met competency um, in any particular area. And then if we go over to our, our transcript, we have, um, we have both a competency-based and traditional transcript. And so you look here at kind of a, a traditional way of showing a transcript in the top area. You'll notice it says download a transcript summary as PDF, or you can download a competency description. It's expanded. And so I can also uh, take on my transcript and I can sort by date. I can sort by um, the different competency groups. I can go down into a competency group and take a look at my progress on, on um, in each of the, the competencies. Now, one of the things I should mention, you'll notice that um, one of the columns is called proficiency and one is called grade. Our courses, we still use the 0 to 100 grading system. 
we have competency assessments that they have to work on where they have to hit a minimum of 85%. So, uh, and, and there will be a number of competency assessments for any one competency. There are formative assessments, which we treat as kind of regular assessments. Um, and then when we jump over to learning to projects, uh, learning through experience, uh, learning through teams, those areas are all graded using rubrics, so we end up with proficiency ratings. And one of the things that we've kind of learned from others is watched how um, schools have made decisions to move to all competency-based ratings or grades and then tend to get into arguments with, um, with the, the public about or, or parents who say, well, I want the grades back. I don't want these proficiency things. Uh, we really need to know if my kid got a 90 or an 80 or an A or a B. And I, I think that really takes focus away from the possibilities of uh, student-centered learning and competency-based education, and you get stuck kind of in the, the grading quagmire. So our decision was, we'll provide both. Um, and so we just do the math behind the scenes, um, and, and we know that for us, you've got to have basically a, a B or above to be proficient. So when we um, assess students using a rating system, we use a three-point scale, which is approaching um, competence, competent, or exceeding. And so that competent level is a B level. Uh, when a student is uh, working in a traditional course, they've got to get at least a B in order to meet competencies. And so we just do the math to convert between the two, rather than uh, getting stuck in um, discussions about whether or not we have grade point averages and, and so forth. And so if I want to request an official transcript, I can fill that out and that will be sent to you. I can get a PDF of my transcript and this would be kind of a, tr somebody wants a traditional transcript that might look like this. Uh, another interesting thing is when we were uh, designing this, we brought in uh, about 20 college admissions uh, personnel and showed them a competency-based transcript and then showed them the idea behind our interactive transcript where they could drill down into actually see the work and they said that's all great but the reality is we're dealing with thousands of applications we just need to see a traditional transcript and so that's one of the reasons that we made this option available was that if anybody wants the detail they can get to it but we don't force that detail on them um, so you'll notice here we have both the proficiency and the grade we have in progress that's what IP means we have all that kind of information but at any point, if someone says, no, I want to really see how students did in each competency, they can get the full competency-based transcript as well. And that's what I'm uh, showing here. And so you can kind of scroll down through and see that it could be quite a long document uh, by the time a student is, is a senior. So that's kind of a, a summary of, of what we're up to. Um, and Marsha, I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. OK, thank you. I just keep saying to myself, wow, 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 this is all just fascinating. And did you say you're about eight years down the road or seven or eight? Is that what you were saying in the beginning? Our school has been open for eight years, yes. Okay. I've got it on my calendar because, you know, you know how we all live. By, our brain is now the calendar. Um, to come back in a couple of weeks or so and check the website. I'm very excited to, to see what that's going to be like as you transition over to your new format. Um, if there are no questions, we can stop. Anyone have any? You're welcome. I see that Clifford, I appreciate you letting us know that you're good to go. Anyone else have any questions? If not, Steve, this has just been absolutely fabulous. I, I appreciate it. And um, I actually have a couple of quick questions for you. So can I call you as soon as we all get off here on your the number I have for you just for a couple of minutes? Uh, my cell number, yeah. Yep, okay, great. All right, thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.